It's good to be in the house of the Lord with the people of God. Amen. You know, I thought it would never happen to me. For years, I have had 20-20 vision. I even told my wife, because I hadn't been to the eye doctor in years, that I still had 20-20 vision. Because the last time I went to the doctor, they told me I had 20-20 vision. And if you don't go for 15 years, you still have 20-20 vision. For years, I could read anything you gave me. I could read down the road. I could see signs down the road. I could read books with little tiny print. I could read the little prescriptions on the back of those little bottles in the store. I could even read my iPhone. But on Tuesday of this week, I sent my wife the following text. In other news, I have increased the font on my phone. Praise God. (laughs) Wow. It seems that turning 50 is going to be the death of me. Can I get an amen to that? I turned 50 in October, and I may not be able to see again. I'm not sure. Actually, it started a couple of years ago. My, uh, my dad has a history of glaucoma in the family, and he said, son, you need to go get your eyes checked. And I thought, well, I'll, one of these days I'll go. And so after he had in, encouraged me a couple of times and learning what glaucoma was, I decided I was going to go get my eyes checked. And, and I had not yet done it, but then I noticed my eyes beginning to fail more and more a little bit. And I found myself one day at the pharmacy counter at Walmart looking for readers. Can I? <laughs> And now I, now I have five pair, or at least I've had five pair. I've lost two of them, broke two of them. Now I understand kind of a little bit why my mama had 20 pairs. She had one pair in every room in the house. How many of you have got 20 pairs and you got them in every house? I really knew that I was coming into old age when we were at the Super Bowl party and we were doing a game or something, or maybe it was a Christmas party, and Pastor Jeff was at the house, and he said, I don't have my readers. And I pulled mine out of the drawer and said, here you go. <laughs> Sorry, brother. <laughs> You know, I thought I had 20-20 vision, but um, just not the case. Uh, my doctor checked me out and said, hey, you're going to be good for a little while. Just use readers. But uh, he then gave me a prescription for bifocals. He said, it's a life choice decision. You might be better off with these. So we'll see how that goes. Too many of us think we have 20-20 spiritual vision. And the fact of the matter is, is that if we look back over our life, maybe at one point we did have 20-20 vision. But now perhaps, like in our real eyesight, some glaucoma has crept in. Maybe your eyes have uh, created an astigmatism. Maybe you have that thing that all people hate to have but adds a little cloudiness to your eye. You've got a cataract that's formed. And I wonder today if maybe spiritually what we need is a spiritual eye test. According to one website about spiritual blindness, here's what they said. The spiritually blind hear the truth, but they cannot see what it means. They cannot see the big picture of salvation. They are unable to see how it applies to their own life. They have trouble confessing the truth because they have difficulty believing what they cannot see. Or maybe the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 59 verse 10 got it right when he said, we grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those without eyes. Or or maybe the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 when he said it this way, the God of this age, that is Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Or to throw one more out there for you, uh, Author, theologian, scholar, pastor, John Piper said it this way. Human beings are spiritually blind to the superior value of the glory of God. Which means that left to ourselves, we will see the gospel, see Christ, see scripture, but not see it or see him for what it truly is. Namely, the most beautiful, valuable reality in the world. Church, I'm going to ask you a question this morning. How's your spiritual eyesight? If you were to do an eye test today, if we were to put up one of those charts on the screen, how would you fare? And by the way, I want to, I want to make a, an assumption. I want to make a statement. 
I believe spiritual blindness is as much a church problem as it is a world problem. You see, I think the world, we look at the world and we know the world is lost. We know they are totally blind. We know they've never seen the light of Christ. We know they've never come into faith in Jesus Christ. We know that. We know that and we want to respond to that. That's why we believe in missions. That's why we give to missions. That's why we go on missions. We believe that Jesus was right when he said, the harvest fields are wide unto harvest. Send forth the laborers into the field. We know that. We believe that. So then why would we say that spiritual blindness is as much a church problem? Here's what I would say. I say, spiritual blindness often accompanies religious life. Spiritual blindness often accompanies religious life because sometimes we get into the place where we believe that we continue to have 2020 vision and those eye problems start coming up you know a person who has cataracts doesn't really know that they have a cataract until some time has passed and then they say you know I don't see as clearly as I used to see I I can't see as far as I used to see I can't see as close as I used to see it's not like it happens suddenly it just happens over time and Spiritual blindness, I believe, is a problem. So this morning, I want us to take an eye test. Take out your Bible and turn with me to Mark chapter 8. That's where we're going to be. The Gospel of Mark, we're coming to the middle of the climax of it. Uh, We've been in this series for several weeks, and Jeff will give us the, what I believe is the climactic point of the Gospel next Sunday. I hope that you'll be here for that. The story that I'm going to give you today is kind of an eye test that leads us into and sets up what Jeff's going to deal next week. I'm going to steal a little bit of his thunder today, but come back next week. But an eye test, an eye test to see where we are spiritually. So if you got your Bible in hand, your glasses in the other one, if you're physically able and can see, would you stand with me for the reading of God's holy word? Uh, we're going to look at Mark chapter 8. We're going to be in verse 11. We're going to read all the way through 20. Well, we're not going to read all the way through 26. So we're going to look at 26. I'm just going to read the first few verses to set our hearts. Here's what the Bible says, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, demanding of him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his heart, he said, why why does this generation demand a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and went to the other side. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, would you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, what the Spirit is saying to the churches, what the Spirit is saying to our church, what the Spirit is saying to us. And would you teach us today in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all the people said amen. 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 You be seated this morning. When you see Jesus for who he truly is, you will live for him in new ways. I want to give you the main idea of my message up front. I want you to to think through this, see if you can remember this. I want you to talk about this at lunch today. You ready for it? New eyes equal new lives. New eyes equal new lives. When we have new eyes to see Jesus for who he is, it will help us to live out our life in a certain way. New eyes equal new lives. And our text is going to reveal for us three insights. You get that? Insight. I thought that was funnier than you, know, than you did, but okay. Three insights. Now, here's the first insight I want to give you today. Total blindness rejects clear truth. Total blindness rejects clear truth. Jesus has just finished feeding the 4,000. The Bible tells us in verse 10 that they get in a boat, they go back over the sea. This whole episode, the last couple of chapters, they've all been around the Sea of Galilee. And here, the Bible says in verse 10, he immediately gets in the boat with his disciples and he went to the district of Dalmanutha. That is the area known as Megadon. If you're looking at the Sea of Galilee on a map, it's the area on the western shore. So you look at it, it's to the left side. They go there and the Bible says that as soon as he gets to the shore there, that there are some Pharisees. The Bible says in verse 11, the Pharisees came and they began to argue with him. As soon as he got off the boat, Maybe it was a couple hours, maybe it was a few days later, we don't know exactly, but whenever he got over there to the other side, they began to argue with him. The Pharisees were always arguing with Jesus. 
You remember the Pharisees, they were the religious goody two-shoes. They were the guys who knew all the laws. In fact, they wrote other laws to add to the laws to make sure you didn't break God's laws. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and even the Herodians all gathered up and ganged up against Jesus. And the Bible says in verse 13, they were demanding of him a sign from heaven to test him. Now, let's be honest, they had seen enough signs, hadn't they? They had seen all kinds of signs. They had seen all kinds of miracles. That's the whole purpose of Mark chapters 1 through 8, to show us that Jesus did all the things that the Messiah was going to come and do. And But here they say, hey, give us a sign from heaven so we can test you. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, signs from heaven were signs that only God can do. Now, things like the 10 plagues that happened in the days of Moses, things like uh, the fire coming down from heaven from the days of Elijah, you see, things that came from heaven down, signs from heaven, were things that only God could do. And they knew that if they put him into that test, he couldn't do that. At least that's what they thought. And that's conversed with signs from the earth because they, they were, you know, the God of this world would allow people to do signs from earth. You remember that Pharaoh's minions, they could do some of the things that Moses did, but they never could reenact exactly what God did. And so here's the situation where Jesus is being demanded to give them a sign. But I love the heart of Jesus because it, it kind of gives us hope for us. He looks at verse 12 and he says, sighing deeply in the spirit. And kinda, he kind of shakes his head and walks to the corner. Why does this generation demand a sign? I don't know that he said it out loud. Maybe it was in his heart. Why, why do they demand a sign? They don't need another sign, Jesus says. In fact, the Bible says that truly I tell you, no sign will be given to them in this generation. And Jesus said, I'm done doing signs with you. You don't need any more signs. But the fact of the matter is total blindness rejects clear truth. They had seen all the signs. I want you to think about what I mean when I say total blindness. Total blindness means total blindness. It means there is absolutely zero light perception in your eye. According to the Institutes of World Health, about 15% of our world has total blindness. Other people, the other 85, have some levels of blindness, maybe legal blindness or color blindness or, or cataracts or whatever. So let's test the theory. Okay, you ready? How many of you like playing games with a preacher? <laughs> Nobody, right? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promise you I'm going to stay on the stage, but I want, you to, I want you to participate in the game, okay? With all eyes closed. Now, I'm not going to come. Nobody bother the person beside you. I know that's what you're afraid of. Somebody's going to touch you. Everybody, eyes closed. And I'm going to hold up my hand. And I want you to tell me how many, num how many fingers I have holding up. Eyes closed. All right, somebody tell me how many fingers I got. I have five. I hear a four. There are three. I see a one. Hey, Evan, I didn't see you back there. Now, I look up. How many fingers I got up? Now, Jeff said none, only because he had already said five, four, three, two, and one. <laughs> but if you had your eyes closed and you were totally blind to what was going on, you had no clue what I had up. Why? Because you're totally blind. You, you see, the darkness, the blindness prevents you from seeing what is right in front of you. You couldn't see it because you were totally blind. In the Bible here, we see these disciples, I mean, excuse me, these Pharisees, and they have been totally blinded to what God has done. If we were to go back and look at all the stories, here's where we've been over the last several weeks. And you don't need to turn there, but let me go through several of them. Mark chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible tells us Jesus drives out an unclean spirit from a man in the synagogue. And the people say, what is this? A new teaching with authority. Even the unclean spirits obey him. Sign number one, if you will. Mark chapter 1, verse 32, Jesus healed all their sick and demon-possessed. Signs 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, however many people there. Mark 2, Jesus healed the paralytic brought by the friends. He's blaspheming, they said, because only God can do this, right? Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, he, Jesus healed the man withered hand on a Sabbath. And the Pharisees go out and they begin to conspire how they're going to kill him. Mark chapter 3, verse 7 through 12, the Bible says in verse 10, he had healed many with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, Jesus heals the demon-possessed man in the region of the Gerasenes. Mark chapter 5, 21 through 43, Jesus healed Jairus' daughter and the woman with the issue of blood. Mark chapter 6, verse 30, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Mark 6, verse 45, Jesus walks on the water. 
verse 53, Jesus performs more miracles such that everyone who touched his robe was healed. Mark chapter 7, Jesus heals the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. Mark chapter 7, the Bible says they were extremely astonished and said he has done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 10, immediately before our passage, Jesus feeds the 4,000. Let's be honest, folks. They didn't need one more sign. And let's be honest, the skeptics of the world don't need another sign either. Jesus even said, if a man comes back from the dead, they'll not even believe that. See, there's no greater miracle than the resurrection. People who are in total blindness don't need one more sign. They have all the truth they need. What they need to do is open their eyes. What they need is the Bible to allow uh, uh, God to open their eyes to, so they can see. People who have total blindness reject clear truth. They avoid it because it's too true for them. But let's move on to the second thing. Not only does total blindness reject clear truth, the second insight is this. Partial blindness reveals partial understanding. You, you tracking that? Partial, uh, partial blindness reveals to us partial understanding. Beginning in the next scene, beginning in verse 14, down through verse uh, 21, we move into a new episode. Uh, we move into section 2. The disciples are beginning to discuss with Jesus what's going on. And they're getting into the boat. They're riding across the water. They're hungry. All they're thinking about is bread. Jesus is talking about something completely different. Look at what it says in verse 14. The disciples had forgotten to take bread and had only one loaf with them in the boat. And then he gave them strict orders. Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, leaven referred to, usually in the Bible, um, something small that made an impact. Twice in the Bible, it is used in a positive way. The kingdom of God is like leaven. It's going to be small. It's going to make impact. It's going to grow and take over, just like yeast takes over a, a piece of bread or roll or whatever. Most of the time, leaven in the Bible is used in a negative way. It's used about sin. And here Jesus uses it to describe the teaching of the Pharisees, the teachings of the Sadducees, the teaching of the Herodians who taught against him being the Messiah. And Jesus says, watch out, beware, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And here's what happens. The disciples in the boat going, is he talking about that we didn't bring lunch? And they're more concerned with lunch, kind of like a pastor on a Sunday morning. Here I am talking about God's Word, and all you're worried about is, what are we going to eat for lunch today? That's the disciples, right? Like, what are we, do we we need to bring enough bread today? But notice what happens. The Bible says in verse 16, they were discussing among themselves that they did not have any bread. And aware of this, he said to them, and Jesus peppers them with questions. And watch this. Jesus looks at them and says, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? And they're going, uh, um, well, um, well, don't you understand or comprehend? Sadly, no. Do you have hardened hearts? Yeah. Do you have eyes and not see? Sadly, yes. Do you have ears that and not hear? Well, yeah. Do you not remember? Well, apparently not. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of leftovers did you collect? Well, um, 12, one for each of us. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets full of did you collect? Um, seven. And then verse 21, don't you understand yet? You see, they had partial understanding. They didn't quite get it. They were struggling to understand the reality, the reality of who Jesus is. And think about it. Having seen all the miracles in Mark chapter 1 through Mark chapter 8, having lived with Jesus every day for three and a half years, they did not fully grasp it. They still did not fully believe. Were they disciples? Yes. Did they understand it? No. I would submit to you by the end of the day, I would argue that before the resurrection, they didn't get it. Even up to the cross, I don't believe they got it. At the cross, I don't believe they got it. Only after the resurrection did the disciples go, oh. And there's many of us that go to church every Sunday that live that same way. 
We, we, we believe that Jesus is Lord. We believe he is Savior. But if we're honest, we don't understand everything. And because we don't understand everything, we have partial blindness. We don't see him for who he is. We don't really see him as just, we see him only as a teacher, a miracle worker, a prophet. Maybe we see him as a son of God, but we do not see him as the son of God. We don't see him as God in the flesh. We don't see him as Emmanuel, God with us. Why? Because we have partial understanding. Many of you know that we do a lot of puzzles at our house. We, we've tried some of your puzzles that you've given us, and we've done them. Uh, recently, some friends of ours who will remain nameless, Bill and Jennifer Coleman, gave us the worst puzzle on the planet. My wife put it together. I had to give credit to her because she did it yesterday or whenever. But you know how it is when you're putting a puzzle together. You're putting all those pieces together. and You know what it's going to be, but somehow or another you're missing the piece in the middle. And you look at it, you know, like, I think it's Mickey Mouse, but he's missing a nose. Like there's just something not there. Like you see it, you grasp it, but you don't really get all of it. And that's kind of the way it is, I think, for the disciples. And I think it's sometimes the way it is for us. We, we look at Jesus, and because we don't quite understand everything about him, we're missing that part, that piece, and it's not the fullness of it. We walk away partially blind. Partially blind because we don't quite see all of it. And if you're in that boat this morning, and I would imagine in a church on a Sunday morning, there are going to be some people who are partially blind. I mean, let's be honest, the disciples didn't get it. <laughs> Maybe we won't get it all either, right? What do you do? One of the things I think you should do is read your Bible. Yeah. Open up your Bible and read God's Word. I mean, how can we really know the God of the universe if we do not read the Word that He gave us? It's amazing to me. It's staggering to me. Born again Christians who never read their Bible, who have never read their Bible once, who do not read it in a seven-day period. I saw in a Bible college survey recently, faculty members at a Bible college, not ours, <laughs> I hope not ours, who don't even read their Bible once a week. How can you say... I know God and not know God's Word. Amen. If you want to not be partially blind, then open up God's Word. Number two, spend time in prayer. Probably my week, not even probably, my absolute weakest of the spiritual disciplines is spending ample time in prayer, spending sometimes any time in prayer. But listen, if we're going to know God, we need to read His Word and commune with Him in daily prayer. Yeah. Yeah. We cannot say, I know God and not spend any time with him? How can we say that? Tend to church. Be in a community. Obey God. Read a book. Read the Bible, but read a book about the Bible and understand theology. Take a Bible college class. I know one down the street. <laughs> I can hook you up. Don't keep walking around with one eye saying that you really understand God. You see, total blindness rejects clear truth. And then partial blindness reveals a partial understanding, not quite getting it. Let's move on to the third and final insight, and that is this. Cured blindness results in new lives. Cured blindness results in new lives. Remember the, the main idea? New eyes equal new lives. Here it is. Now, if you're of the medical community or like our good eye doctor in the church, your body just cringed when I said cured blindness. Because you know that blindness currently in the world is not curable. But hold on to that thought. Notice what happens in verse 22. We, we move once again to this, this third of four series of stories. Again, Jeff's going to deal with story number four next week. We're going to lean into that a little bit. But the third story is connected. But the third story is an oddity. It's the only time we ever read this story. It's not in any of the other Gospels. It's only right here. And it has some unique features to it. And I want us to be honest about the text. I want us to be clear. A couple of things. Number one, is there anything that Jesus cannot do fully on his own? No. And number two, is there anything that he needs our help in doing? No. 
If those two truths are true, and I believe that they are, Jesus doesn't need anything else to do something fully the first time, nor does he need any of our help to do anything at all, then what's going on in this weird, wacky text? Then it has to be here for a purpose. Because we're going to see in this text what is known, if you will, as a two-stage healing. That it takes Jesus two times to do something to get the healing done. And if we just agreed with what we agreed on, then what's the deal here? I want to give you a teaching moment for you. When I teach hermeneutics at the Bible college, the things I teach my students to do when they're reading the Gospels ask two questions. Number one, what does this story tell me about who Jesus is? Because that's what the Gospels are about. And number two, what is the author trying to tell me by the way he puts these stories beside each other? And if we looked at what we just talked about, the story that we began with was total blindness of the Pharisees. They saw, but they saw nothing. Amen? And then the next story was the disciples. They could kind of see, they kind of grasped who Jesus was, but not fully. So we got total blindness and partial blindness. And what I think we see here is that Jesus does a healing, but it's also a lived out parable that's teaching the disciples a lesson. Let's look at it and see if this makes sense to you. In verse 22, the Bible says they came to Bethsaida. Here they go, back and forth. They're now on the eastern shore. And now they go up to Bethsaida. The Bible says they brought a blind man to him. And he begged him to touch him. Isn't it it encouraging to know that Jesus touches us? All throughout the Gospel of Mark, we see Jesus touching touching people and healing them. He he, he put his fingers in the guy's ear the other week. I think that was Andrew preaching. He he laid his hands on the, the woman who had the issue of blood. He tucked Jairus' daughter Jesus comes into us with great compassion, and when we're hurting and needing a touch, Jesus heals us, and he grabs us, if you will, by the hand. Praise God. Amen? Amen. So here in this text, Jesus comes, and the Bible says they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. And Jesus, in verse 23, he took the blind man by the hand and brought him out of the village. We don't have time to get into all the details of why he took him out of the village, but part of it was because Bethsaida had refused all of the miracles of Jesus. And later, Jesus is going to say, woe unto you, Bethsaida, for the miracles I'd done in you had been done in Tyre's side, and they got saved a long time ago. <laughs> so warning, right? And there's other stuff there. But notice what happens. He, he takes them out, and then the Bible says in the middle of verse 23, he spit on his eyes. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Don't do that to me. The the touch will do. The spit's got to go. (laughs) Spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? Do do you hear? He he looks at a blind man who's never seen a thing in the days of his life, and he says, do you see anything? And notice the response of the man in verse 25. He looked up and he said, I see people. And they look like trees walking. In other words, the man is beginning to see, but he can't see clearly. He knows what a person's like. He's probably touched his dad on the head and his arms, and he knows knows what that's like. He's touched a tree, but trees don't walk. And so he says, it's kind of like a tree. I kind of, this is what I see a tree like, but it's walking. He's beginning to see. He's moving from total blindness to partial blindness. He's beginning to have some clarity. He's beginning to see, but he doesn't see clearly yet. And notice the overemphasis on all the words that have to do with seeing and knowing and understanding. Do you see? Do you hear? Do you understand? Do you comprehend? Hear? Do you see? And I see, but not clearly, but then keep going. Verse 25, again, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes. Then the man looked intently and his sight was restored. It was cured. And the Bible says he saw everything clearly. Here this man lives out the parable of going from total blindness to partial blindness to full sight restored. And then when he is cured, he has a new life before him. Folks, I want to tell you today that we're talking about cured, not what you do to ham. We're talking about cured. Jesus touched this man and took him from total blindness and gave him full sight. Not temporary sight's going to fade out later. Not, not something, not colorblind that's going to come and go. Not, not a cataract that's going to come in. He gave him clear sight. And the Bible says in a different word every time the man looked intently and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. 
You see, cured blindness results in new lives. And this man goes out and does a new thing. But more than that, I don't submit to you that disciples are living this out. You see, the disciples were in that darkness, right? And then they put their faith in Christ and they began to live, I believe, partially. And before the cross, I believe they struggled. Next week, when we get to chapter 4 or or the next, uh, the fourth story, you're going to learn that Jesus takes them away. And in this climactic episode of the whole gospel of Mark, outside the cross, it pinnacles here and then it moves to the cross. In this episode, next Sunday, Jesus is going to ask the question, who do people say that I am? Well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah. Others are going to say you're one of the prophets. And Jesus looks at them and says, but who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And all of us would say, bingo, amen? In the next verse, Jesus says, and the Son of Man must go and be suffered and beat and killed And rise again. And they say, no, 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 no. You see, they didn't understand it. They they grasped it, but they didn't understand it. Chapter 9, verse 31, again, Jesus is going to tell the disciples, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he's killed, he will rise three days later. And the Bible says, but they did not understand this statement. Chapter 10, verse 30, again, Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he says to them in verse 32, taking the 12 aside again, he began to tell them the things that would happen. Quote, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him, kill him. He will rise after three days. And you know what they said? Now, when you get in your glory, can I sit on your right and your left? They didn't get it. And I submit that most of us in the room don't get it. I really believe if we really got it, really got it, our lives would be different. You see, I believe that that we would really begin to worship Jesus freely and fully. I believe we would run out of this church on a Sunday morning to go tell people about Jesus. I believe that it would change who we are because new eyes equal new lives. You say, well, prove that to me in Scripture. Here it is. Before the cross, where did the disciples go? They did whatever Jesus did, but they didn't quite understand. And when Jesus went to the cross, where were they? Where were they? Gone. Some of them went back to fishing. If they really got it, they would have been there and they would have done it, right? Even in the book, even after the resurrection, until the resurrection rather, they're just kind of doing their thing. They kind of sit back and like, well, I don't know. The guy's on the road to Emmaus. They're like, well, I don't know. We thought he was the Messiah, but he died. and Now we're not so sure. But after the resurrection, their lives changed. They changed. You read the book of Acts and you see that these men went out and changed the world. Listen to just a a couple of these. In Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to these words. Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. This Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs that God did among you through him. Just as you shall know, though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and to kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. They began to preach differently. In Acts chapter 2, they began to do life together. The Bible tells us in Acts 2, verse 46 and 47, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Acts chapter 4, they began to teach and preach, and the, the persecution came among them. The Bible says in verse 19, Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide. We are unable to stop speaking about what we have heard. Acts chapter 4, they began to pray together. And the Bible says when they had prayed, the place where they had assembled was shaking. Their prayer life was revolutionary. Yeah. Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter and apostles replied, we must obey God rather than people. 
In other words, the culture did not constrict them to what they were doing. The Bible says we are witness of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Acts chapter 5, verse 42, every day in the temple and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Their lives were changed so much that in Acts chapter 7, a young deacon by the name of Stephen would proclaim boldly to the point that they would pick up rocks and stone them to death. And in that moment, the Bible says, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they began to punish him. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. It changed their life. Amen. You see, when we have new eyes, when we go from total blindness to cured blindness, when we go from partial blindness to cured blindness, it will equal new lives. You say, well, what does that look like? Well, when we have new eyes, we will see Jesus in all his majesty, glory, and splendor. When we have new eyes, we will see Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. When we have new eyes, we will see Christ's church as a priority decision. When we have new eyes, we will see the word of God as our daily bread. When we have new eyes, we will see Jesus as a sinner and the focus of our worship. When we have new eyes, we will see fellow believers and brothers and sisters as co-heirs and co-servants in God's kingdom. When we have new eyes, we'll see the lost world as sheep without a shepherd, and we will see them as people in desperate need of a good shepherd. When we have new eyes, we will see every day in every situation, in every person through the eyes of a loving Savior. When we have new eyes, we will make our choices to match God's choice and live like his son. His thoughts will be our thoughts. His hopes will be our hopes. His choices will be our choices. His compassion will be our compassion. When we have new eyes, we will have new lives. So my question to you, church, as we finish this morning is this. How is your eyesight today? How is your eyesight? Maybe, maybe what we need this Memorial Day weekend is not another cookout. Maybe what we need this Memorial Day weekend is not another trip to the beach and some homemade ice cream, although those are things are fine. Maybe what we need this weekend is not even just to remember the fallen. Maybe what we need this weekend is to sit at home and ask ourselves, how's my eyesight? How's my spiritual eyesight today? And I want you to do that this morning. I want you to answer this question with every head bowed, with every eye closed. I want you to ponder in your heart this question. Lord Jesus, how's my eyesight this morning? Lord Jesus, how's my eyesight this morning? Between you and God Almighty, would you just answer that question? And, and let's not be so quick, by the way, to say that just because you're in church on a Memorial Day weekend that you have cured blindness. Because the Pharisees were the religious goody two-shoes of their day, and they were totally blind to Jesus. And the disciples didn't get any much better. They lived with Jesus for three and a half years. And I'm not sure until the resurrection if they really got it. So again, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you to just ask God to reveal to you the condition of your eyesight today. Are you totally blind? If so, you need to come to faith in Jesus Christ today. Give him your heart today. Are you here this morning? You would say, well, brother, I, I'm partially blind. 
would you do business with God right now to commit to reading his word and seeking his face and praying and whatever it is that you need to do to grow in your own personal walk so that you have fuller understanding and not partial. And maybe some of you are here and you have cured blindness. You, 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 you worship Jesus unhindered every day. You read his word with deep hunger. You share the gospel. You serve the church. There's nothing that you need to do any better. Just love him more and praise God if that's you. But I would just imagine that today that several of us in here struggle with spiritual glaucoma, spiritual cataract, and we need God to remove some of that. Maybe it's crept up over the last couple of years. Maybe your eyesight is no longer 2020. Maybe you you know Jesus, maybe you love Jesus, but maybe maybe today there's something that you need Jesus to do. Ask him to touch you this morning. As the worship team leads, would you sing? Would you respond in Jesus name?